SCP-3069 to force the hand of God. If you've been following this series up to this point, you'll have seen a fair number of anomalies based around the oceans and strange creatures and structures underneath them. To be perfectly frank then, I have run out of snappy intros that introduce another ocean-based anomaly without spoiling anything, so let's skip the preamble this time and just get right into it. SCP-3069 is a massive, physical construct extending approximately 6,000 kilometers, or over 3,700 miles, across the North Atlantic Ocean. This construct is continually releasing specimens and substances of unknown origin. The purpose of this has been expunged by order of the O5 Council, so we'll get to that later, but the end result is referred to as an Innova Exonera event. The construct only recently started doing this, and was most likely triggered by a notable event taking place in June of 2020 when the last functioning transatlantic telecommunications cable suffered a massive failure within the vicinity of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Upon investigation by a civilian company, it was discovered that a section of a massive metallic structure had breached through a gap in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and severed the cable at three separate points. When a NOAA exploration team investigated the breach point, their unmanned submarine revealed a number of unknown organisms that had already been released into the area. The construct has three known access points, all of which are also the points where it severed the communications cable. Due to its large size though, it's very likely that it has an unknown number of additional entrances which cannot be located. The first access point is a large sealed pipe, 25 meters wide, at a depth of around 3500 meters. It allows entry into the construct through a series of external wiring ports on its underside. It was eventually discovered that a light electrical current applied to two of the three visible ports opened up a square hatch. The second access point is identical in form and function to the first, located 3200 meters down. It appears to have suffered an internal structural failure at some point however, and opening its hatch yields a blockage of an unknown but non-toxic sponge-like object. Drilling through it has been considered but not attempted yet due to its size and density. The third access point is an invisible cylindrical spatial distortion, around 4,000 meters down, the size of which is estimated at a diameter of 150 meters and a height of 400 meters. The anomalous nature of this access point appears to be caused by the installation of an immovable electromagnetic device. This device is a steel pole embedded in the sea floor topped with a phosphorescent sphere composed of an unknown material. The device constantly emits a faint green light, a magnetic flux field, and low levels of gamma radiation. The Foundation set up a provisional site around this third access point to prevent unknown life forms from exiting the structure, prevent normal marine life from entering the structure, and to establish a point of research for the structure as a whole. Five months after the structure's initial discovery, it came time for the Foundation to send in a team to start exploring it. Three members of MTF Gamma-6 volunteered for the operation, Agents Jones, Garcia, and Lockwood. They were to enter through the hatch in Access Point 1, and ascertain various details if possible, such as the origin of the anomaly and its purpose, any hazards that are present inside, how much of the anomaly is traversable, whether it is one structure or multiple similar ones, and finally whether or not it contains life. They were all given standard high pressure scuba gear and class 6 hazardous exposure suits. Two of the agents were given waterproof digital cameras, while the third, Jones, was given a head mounted video camera to record footage. 
Jones was also given a radio to communicate with observation personnel. All three were equipped with full-body locking restraint harnesses, attached to a cord repelling system which were subsequently attached to their submersible outside of the structure, in case they needed to be rapidly pulled out. Since the team members only have 40 minutes of air supply, it's going to be a short trip if there's no breathable atmosphere inside of the structure. The three proceed into the hatch at the access point, entering into a dark, flooded hallway. It's clearly dilapidated, with some sort of green algae growth on the equipment here. The water here is cloudy, with their lights going no more than 15 meters out. They continue down the hallway, sticking against one of the walls, and they come across some engravings on the wall, written in an unknown language. They find another hatch, and are told that opening it may cause some pressure differentiation that could induce physical symptoms. Observational personnel tell the team that if they're unsure about proceeding, they could always just send some D-class in, but the team continues. After trying to open the hatch, they realize that the wheel on it doesn't turn counterclockwise, but instead clockwise. The hatch opens, revealing some far murkier water, filled with dead fish and what appears to be blood and some sort of green, slimy substance. They start moving through the hatch, at which point they've already used up 10 minutes of their air supply. There's a wall of a thick, transparent glass or plastic material here. It's fogged up, but it's looking out over the sea floor, with two massive spotlights illuminating the area. Something odd is going on here though, as the team should be under the sea floor at this point, but the view seems to indicate that they're about 100 meters above it, with the area not matching up with the environment surrounding the structure. The floor of the room is also transparent, and after pushing some fish guts out of the way, Jones can see some artificial lamps lighting the seafloor down there, with some fish moving in the sand. The team passes through a smaller hatch, continuing downwards, and they come across a platform with switches on it, with engraving next to each switch. Jones describes it as some sort of directory but is told not to interact with the platform at all. They also find where all the blood and fish guts are coming from, as there's some sort of intake vent near them with spinning blades. There's a thin mesh grate, but behind it is the torn up body of what appears to be a whale, the viscera of which is leaking through the grate. There's no other way for them to progress through the structure without using the platform, which is likely an elevator of sorts. The observational team says that using that elevator is ill-advised, as there's no telling what an unknown transportation device would do to humans. They instead decide to open the grate and access the intake vent, at which point the small whale carcass goes flying into the room, sending blood and guts everywhere. Fortunately, their suit's rebreathers can filter all that out, but they're running low on time, with only 23 minutes of air left. Inside of the vent, there's a massive rushing current that they can't cross, and the anomalous nature of the interior makes it so that they should be back inside of the room with the glass right now, but they're not. One of the team notices another set of engravings on the wall near the rushing current, and decides to crawl down some pipes to take a photo. The observational team does not advise this at all, but she does so anyways. Sure enough, the pipes snap under her weight and fall off, forcing the other two team members to hold on to her cord to prevent her from getting pulled away by the rushing current. Unfortunately, the current is too strong, and the other two begin to slip forwards. The fallen agent, Lockwood, decides to pull out her knife and cut her cord, saving the other two as she gets pulled away by the current into darkness. Jones swears that he can hear her down the stream, but the observational team tells him that it's highly unlikely he would be able to hear her at this point, 
and they should return immediately. After climbing out of the vent, Jones reports that the whale's carcass is suddenly missing, and the water in this room is clear again. After 20 seconds of radio silence, he begins speaking into the radio in hushed tones, saying that there's something off. There's an entity on the wall by the elevator device. The observational team tells him that if it's unsafe to speak, remain silent and exit the structure. Otherwise, describe and photograph the entity. Jones says that he can't, because the entity isn't visible. He knows it's there though, as that's where the lighting changed. It turned something on over by the elevator, and it's messing with the switches, but he doesn't think it's looking at him yet. The observational team suggests that it might be a paranoia response following trauma, but Jones assures them that this isn't a hallucination. He knows that the entity cleaned up the whale gunk and is now fixing the elevator. He says that he knows it's there because there's a clearer patch of water and a slight difference in the light, and he can see it move. It's not invisible, but it's incorporeal, and he can't actually tell if it's there or not. Garcia says he notices the same things as Jones. Jones doesn't think that it can hear, as he's now talking at normal volume, and it still hasn't seemed to notice them. After a 25 second period of silence, Jones swears into his radio and says that every time he moves, he feels it noticing him, as if it can feel the movement in the water. Jones says that it definitely can't hear, or at least it can't hear through the suit and the water, but he knows that it's moving. He feels a hot spot on his head, like a headache and the entity is like a fuzzy spot in his vision, like he's looking at a bright light. The spot moves just like his headache does. The headache is now on his left temple, as the entity has moved to the left side of the room to stop them from exiting. The observational team tells him that if he feels it necessary, move faster to exit the hatch so they can reel in the line. Jones responds that the entity won't chase them, but when asked how he knows this, he just swears about the pain in his head. He doesn't want to go past this thing, because if he goes for the hatch now, he'll walk right through the entity, and he has a very strong feeling that he shouldn't. The team tells him that if the entity is incorporeal, he'll most likely be fine walking through it, even if it appears to be occupying a physical space. Jones swears that this is different, as this entity is here, and he sees it as little shapes swimming around in his vision, trying to get in his head. The team asks if he's had cognitohazard resistance training, but Jones replies that he's a scuba diver, not a memeticist. In that case though, the team advises the two to proceed out of the structure as fast as possible, as they're running out of air. Jones says that he can't, and neither can Garcia. He'd rather run out of air, and the entity is staring straight at him, and straight through him. It just made a ringing noise in his head, and it's making his vision go blue and his ears bleed. Some radio distortion is heard along with scraping sounds and unintelligible vocalizations, followed by 23 seconds of silence. Jones comes back on, panicked, stating that it got in him. The observational team says that they have less than 10 minutes of air supply left, and they need to exit immediately. They ask where Garcia is, and after 20 seconds of silence, Jones responds with, safe. The team says that if they're both safe, they should leave, and asks where the entity is. Jones responds with, un-present. The team asks to confirm that the entity is no longer present, and after some unintelligible interference, Jones says that the entity is no longer present. 
The team tells them to return to the vehicle, and after some more unintelligible interference, Jones says, The vehicle. I am coming. Not even the Foundation is foolish enough to overlook that sort of odd behavior, and after Jones and Garcia are recovered, they're taken into the site for questioning and medical treatment. Jones's health, however, continued to rapidly decline, and they weren't able to interview him before he died. An autopsy revealed that his cause of death was a heart attack, presumably triggered by a blocked artery. In his brain, abnormally high levels of dopamine and serotonin were found, and several unidentified substances were found on both his skin and in his bloodstream, despite there being no leaks present in his suit or oxygen tank. Most of the substances were later found to be previously undiscovered sulfur-based compounds, all of which match up with substances found to leak from the structure itself. Jones's body was marked as biologically hazardous and was incinerated. Four days after his death, a breach in the Foundation facility's hull was detected. After it was automatically sealed off, a response team was sent out to investigate the damage, with no audio or video recordings of the event due to the low severity level of the breach. Afterwards, team leader Swain was interviewed by the site security director to discuss what the team witnessed. The director first asks if there was anything abnormal about the water that filled the affected section after the hull breached, but Swain says that both the water and the pressure were normal. What was abnormal, however, was the entity that they all noticed inside of the breach, which Garcia recognized as resembling Lockwood, the agent that went missing. Swain also recognized her face, saying that she's pretty distinctive looking, so he remembered her. Her body, however, must have gotten torn up due to the pressure difference when getting sucked into the hull breach. She was still wearing remains of a scuba suit, but it was all torn up. The director wants to confirm that she appeared to be fully dead, which Swain responds with asking how could she not be dead after that. The director understands that that would be the case normally, but this is an abnormal situation, and they want to recover the body to determine what occurred on board the device. Swain questions his usage of the word device, asking if the Foundation thinks that this thing has a function still. The director, in turn, asks him to clarify what he means by still. Swain says that clearly the structure used to serve some purpose, but it's abandoned and defunct now, which is what they discovered in their initial exploration. The director isn't at liberty to discuss any of those details, but Swain now questions what makes them think that the structure is still active. The director moves back to Lockwood's body, which Swain admits was dead looking. The director asks if their team can recover the body, but Swain isn't so sure, as her body was quite a few feet from them, and the water was murky enough that if she drifted any further back, she'd have been out of sight. The director questions why Lockwood's body is not within the site itself if the hull section had been repaired, but Swain honestly couldn't say, admitting that there was something unusual about her body. He mentions the faint green light that comes out of the steel pole embedded in the sea floor, and says that he saw that color in a string, but only for a moment. He hesitates telling the director about this, but says that it's a very weird color, almost dark, like too dark to be light waves and it hurts your eyes, like an ultraviolet bulb. The color was coming out of her in little strings, and it felt weird to look at, like he was looking at something that wasn't supposed to be there, like a mirage. The strings were coming out of her mouth and out between her legs, and sort of coiled around her leg where the suit was torn. He's having trouble wording it, and says that it was awful to look at, 
comparing it to someone taking a bunch of cords and threading them through her body, in one end and out the other. Swain says that the steel pole is clearly made of the same stuff, the thing that causes Axis Point 3's boundary in the first place. The director clarifies then that Swain believes that Lockwood's body is not present in the site because the anomalous material that was present in her body activated and transported her body away. Swain then says that he only noticed the strings once he looked directly into her eyes, and then she was gone. He mentions that they all know what happened to Jones, because word gets out, but when he says what he heard has happened, the dialogue is redacted from the record due to being unconfirmed speculative information. The director understands that Swain doesn't believe it a coincidence that the body disappeared right after he looked directly at it. Swain says that if something is watching the odd colored material, he's worried that that means they're watching the site too, and if they can use that stuff to transport a human body at a moment's notice, they could potentially transport the entire site when the time is right. The director counters that the third access point has been determined to be a stable, if anomalous, point in space, showing no signs of growing, shrinking, or failing. But Swain replies that it could be because they are watching the Foundation measure it. The director tells him that he'll pass along his concerns to his supervisors, but after the site director hears about it, the claims are dismissed due to lack of video evidence and the cloudy, low-light environment of the location. Therefore, the Foundation concludes that it is possible that Lockwood is both still alive and still in the structure, with the sighting being a shared anomalous hallucination among the team. Meanwhile, the structure is continually leaking a variety of foreign substances, as well as some unknown life forms into the surrounding water. Most of the substances are sulfur based, while the life forms are similar in appearance to marine life from the lowest levels of the ocean, but are typically not recognizable as any species currently present on Earth, beyond some visual similarities. The presence of these materials is estimated to signify the beginning of the structure's activation which will eventually lead to the Innova Exonera event by 2024, which will in turn cause the start of a planet-wide EK-class evolutionary restruction scenario. In other words, the structure is in the early stages of transforming our planet into one hospitable by a different form of life. Research into the frequency at which both biological and chemical matter is leaking from the structure has shown that this event is unavoidable, and has likely already begun to progress towards activation significantly. It's estimated that the full release of these foreign specimens was intended to occur in the 1940s, but was delayed by unknown errors on board the structure, which eventually culminated in the seismic shift that displaced the structure. As exploratory efforts have been greatly reduced due to severe loss of personnel, this cannot be confirmed. Further research is ongoing, of course. Finally, we're given an addendum that's classified for all personnel except the O5 Council and a couple of site directors. We're informed that the following text should not be printed, transcribed, or otherwise copied from this electronic version, and it should not be intentionally memorized for later recollection. The extended description of SCP-3069 states that it is a massive, physical construct extending approximately 6,000 kilometers across the North Atlantic Ocean. At the time of this writing, it is continually releasing specimens and substances of unknown origin, the purposes of which appear to be environmental disruption, which will culminate with the implementation of accelerated artificial evolutionary advancement 
of most, if not all, of Earth's species. Hundreds of new species will be released from the structure, evidenced by exploration of several access points and pre-released materials of a similar nature. Due to the toxicity towards humans and the anomalous growth rate of specimens released, it is estimated that SCP-3069 will successfully cause an evolutionary overhaul culminating with the extinction of at least 90-95% to of humanity within several centuries. This is referred to as an Innova Exonera event. We're given a research document related to the unknown language that was found by the exploratory team, with close connections found with both Egyptian and Mi'kmaq hieroglyphic writings. The first sign they found is translated with one figure meaning safe, secure, solid, a second figure meaning zone, place, area, a third meaning threat, danger, a fourth meaning wind, force, stream. The second sign has a figure meaning carry, transport, bring, a figure meaning produce, grow, form, a figure meaning zone, place, area, a figure meaning again, a figure meaning build, building, construct, a figure meaning earth, dirt, nature, and a figure meaning spirit, soul, life. The first sign, found near the entrance to the first access point, clearly seems to refer to the hatch to the exterior, while the second, found near the tunnel in which Lockwood went missing, is a bit less clear. Something about transporting towards a production zone related to building earth and forms of life likely an area where the structure makes the sulfur substances and the foreign life forms. A D-class was sent over to directly approach and touch the steel pole embedded in the ground. After touching the sphere on top of the pole, the camera footage showed that the sphere was severely and rapidly degrading the palm of the D-class's glove. They expressed concerns over the radio, stating that they were unable to remove their hand from the sphere. After 15 seconds, the glove ruptured, and water flooded into the D-Class's suit, soon causing their death due to internal bleeding from pressure differentiation. Afterwards, the researchers state that it's possible that the sphere simply holds a high temperature at all times, but the fact that the D-Class claimed that they couldn't remove their hand from the sphere makes this a little odd. It's possible that Swain's hypothesis about sapient entities continually observing the sphere is correct after all. A few weeks later, a D-Class was purposefully exposed to an unknown entity that emerged from the third access point, appearing to belong to the class Hydrozoa an animal in the same phylum as jellyfish. The entity, phosphorescent with tendrils and approximately a half meter in length, slowly attached itself to his body. What follows is expunged from the record, which is pretty remarkable for such a high clearance document, and is only available to three of the O5 members. Whatever occurred went on until such a point at which he was unwilling to respond to his name and designation, or any relevant conversation prompts, instead only taking his mask off, making continual eye contact with researchers through the glass, and repeating a phrase in an unknown language until he drowned. Further human testing research was denied afterwards by the site director, pending override approval. A couple of weeks later, an unmanned exploration was made into the second access point, using a miniature drone, lasting a total of 45 minutes before the drone safely returned. The blockage in the second access point was cleared through power drilling, following which a massive amount of both animate and deceased lifeforms flooded out of the orifice, swarming the drone. The drone recovered 
but returned for repairs before progressing into a tunnel which progressively shrunk in diameter. After several dozen meters, the tunnel diameter appeared too small for the drone to pass through, but a secondary path to the left was detected. The drone proceeded down it, and through seven other tunnels of varying length and diameter until it emerged nine minutes later in a massive chamber lined with what appeared to be hundreds of transparent glass containers, each with some sort of powered off display screen adjacent to it. The drone approached one of the containers, but an unknown entity knocked into it, disrupting the recording equipment. When it reactivated 90 seconds later, the drone was now on dry ground, pointing upward at a dimly lit small room. A humanoid figure was seen pacing the room before approaching the drone, looking directly into its lens and throwing it back into the water. The figure appeared to be human in origin, but was severely deformed in a manner that appeared both artificial and recent in occurrence. Its facial features were severely distorted, with an unknown dark green fluid present on the face and teeth, the upper row of which was fully visible due to a section of the figure's upper lip appearing to have been torn off. Later enhancement of the video footage indicated that the individual was wearing a Foundation uniform most closely matching that of scientific research departments. After four minutes of murky water and slightly distorted footage, the drone was seen returning to the tunnels from which it originally came. Ten minutes later, it emerged with only minor damage and returned for footage retrieval. The fact that a Foundation employee in such a state as that is on board the structure is disconcerting and even further so considering that there exists apparently one or more areas of the structure that are not submerged in water, which seem to hold air capable of supporting human life. While it would be useful to get an air sample from there, there's no way of telling from the footage how the drone got to that location, making it near impossible to reach the same area again. The presence of hundreds of what appeared to be containment units within the structure would explain the source of the specimens it releases, and is worthy of further investigation, potentially in the form of a manned exploration. Sometime later, several personnel from a nearby site were sent 45 kilometers offshore to dispatch a large deep sea research vessel which descended to a depth of 800 meters for a period of six days. Over this time, the vessel collected multiple specimens, including several species of plankton and one cephalopod. All of the species collected were previously unheard of and did not match any existing documentation, though the plankton appeared physically similar to some known species in initial testing. The cephalopod appeared to be an oversized member of a known species, one notably not native to the North Atlantic, though purple in coloration and possessing 19 arms. The cephalopod's excretions were found to be severely toxic to both humans and other animals, leading to blistering of the skin and the onset of seizures within 10 minutes. While animal subjects survived with apparent neurological damage, the two human subjects expired due to cardiac arrest, 30 to 45 minutes later. They later gathered up some more specimens, including a creature similar to a polypodium, another animal belonging to the same phylum as jellyfish. Since this one was animate, it was allowed to exit its tank at which point it spent 13 minutes rolling itself across the floor at a slow speed. While you might think that the researchers cleared the room to let this thing move, they did not, and it ended up rolling into the leg of one researcher. Fortunately, she was left with only a large blister on her ankle, and the specimen was returned to its tank before later being terminated. The point is, 
SCP-3069 is releasing all sorts of creatures, dangerous to our normal forms of life, and there doesn't seem to be a way for the Foundation to stop it. The final addenda is from 056, who states that while some personnel were taking some water samples from a beach near Site-42, they stopped responding to radio calls and never returned to the site, now being flagged as missing in action. The O5 writes that this is a dangerous topic to research, and himself and some others don't find it a coincidence that one of the personnel missing is extremely visually similar to the individual seen in the drone footage, wearing the same uniform. SCP-3069 research personnel insist that its anomalous effects go no further than its size, framework, origin, and extra-dimensional capabilities, but he doesn't see how a minor temporal effect would be all that absurd given the other things. For a machine of that scale, a temporal anomaly pattern may very well show up as nothing other than a metaphysical glitch. You can't have a device that alters and outright denies our laws of physics to such an extreme degree without having a few flukes. He states that this thing isn't here to watch us, as it's been here too long for a generic purpose like that. It's here because someone, something, somewhere made the decision to interfere with the way this planet's biology functions. And in their eyes, whatever they're doing is long overdue, so they've decided to accelerate it. He advises no further direct interaction with SCP-3069, as there's nothing further to clarify at this point. To summarize then, this structure has been under the Atlantic Ocean for an unknown amount of time, especially when you consider that they have access to some sort of temporal anomalies on top of everything. The entities running this structure built it with the eventual goal of transforming Earth from a planet hospitable to carbon-based lifeforms to one hospitable to sulfur-based lifeforms. They're clearly advanced, capable of teleporting matter at will at the very least, and while the lifeforms they're releasing are normal enough when it comes to their physicality, the entities themselves are incorporeal. They also seem capable of entering into a person's body, taking over their minds to some degree, although they don't appear to be compatible with our physiology. At least, not yet. So far, the Foundation has concluded that there's nothing that they can do about the steady release of these new creatures and substances. Their plan for the future actually involves them focusing on information control about the planet's transformation, and evacuating coastal towns and moving everyone inland. They still plan on losing 60% of the population of North America 10 years after the Anova Exonera event completes, and Foundation sites will go into full lockdown mode. Finally, SCP-2000 will be fully activated and will be in use for an estimated 250 to 500 years. This plan, however, is heavily based on these strange entities not performing some sort of full takeover of the planet, which would seem to be their end goal. Overall, the plan seems to be a tad odd for the Foundation, considering that it doesn't seem like they made any sort of hostile expeditions into the structure. While the Foundation isn't usually overtly militaristic when it comes to anomalies, it's strange that they would expect the GOC to just roll over and accept the end of the world without trying to bombard it with torpedoes. While plans can change, and maybe the O5 Council will change their minds about remaining hands-off about the structure, I for one welcome our new sulfur-based overlords. <laughs>